I want to thank you for joining us for worship this morning. Uh, we've got some exciting stuff coming up. We've got some music that I know you're going to enjoy. But before we get into the message this morning, I wanted to give you parents particularly uh, a warning that there's going to be some graphic content uh, in the message that I preach in just a few minutes. If you would like to take this time to skip ahead to Mr. Kevin and Junior Church, uh, that would probably be a good idea if you have young children. We're going to be talking about the story of David and Bathsheba, and, uh, and it's going to be pretty graphic. I'm not going to hold back any punches with that. Uh, we are looking forward to worshiping with you this morning uh, and looking to see what God's Word has to say for us. Good morning. We've been missing being part of the worship service, so we've decided to divide the praise team up and record a few raw videos to add to the worship service. We're all missing everyone and are ready to be back together and have some sort of normalcy, but until then, we are thankful to have the ability to record. Psalms 95.1 says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. We hope you worship with us this morning, and we can't wait to see you. Like most of you with school-aged children, our family is entering week 8 or 9 or 73 or something other like that of being homeschoolers. And we have found that some assignments take the whole family to get them done. This past week, our fourth grader, Kate, uh, she had an assignment where she was supposed to write a haiku. Now, the first thing our family had to do was Google what in the world a haiku is. It's a Japanese form of poetry. So Fran sits down with her and she explains to her what a haiku is and helps her to choose a topic and, and get started on it and everything like that. Well, she chooses the topic of turkey hunting. Now, I don't mean to brag on my child, 
But I've been to some Japanese restaurants before, and I've never seen turkey on the menu. So I'm pretty sure that this is the first haiku that's ever been written about turkey hunting, and it's probably going to end up in a museum somewhere. But every line of the poem has to have a certain number of syllables. So Eva, our third grader, was helping out her sister as Kate's over there brainstorming what to write in the poem. Eva's over there clapping out the syllables to make sure that, uh, that the form is the way that it's supposed to be. Well, Fran had to leave the room for a minute, so I stepped up to the plate and helped her work on the very last line of her poem. Uh, she had written about how she'd gone turkey hunting and harvested her first, go uh, her first gobbler, and uh, she was trying to think about something to write in that last line. I said, well, why don't you write about uh, eating it? And so she came up with this five-syllable dandy of a last line all by herself. It was really good. So we've got Kate writing this 15-word poem. We've helped her with that, and I'm feeling over there like we are like parents of the year for helping her with this thing. Until I got to thinking about King David and his homeschooling expertise with his son Solomon. Many scholars believe that David wrote Psalm 119, the, the chapter that we've been studying for the past few weeks as a church together, that he wrote Psalm 119 to help his son Solomon learn the Hebrew alphabet. Now the Old Testament was written in the language of Hebrew and Hebrew has 22 different letters in its alphabet and if you look at Psalm 119, it's broken up into 22 sections and each line within each section begins with the same letter of the Hebrew alphabet in order. Many scholars believe that that's how Solomon taught his son Solomon, that Hebrew alphabet. Well, Psalm 119 has 176 verses in it. Largest chapter, longest chapter in the Bible. Here we've just helped our kid write a 15-word poem uh, for, for, their, for her schooling. And Solomon, or David rather, writes the longest chapter in the Bible for his kid. You know, it kind of puts in perspective that maybe we're not so good at this homeschooling thing after all. There's a lot of different methods that are used to teach children. You know, we can, we can write a poem, or I know Kevin, a lot of times during junior church, he'll use food, or he's always got some type of visual aid to help teach children. But one of the main ways that, that we've used for centuries now to help teach children about God, it's through song. We all remember the songs that we were taught about God and, and about His Son, Jesus, from when we were growing up as little kids. Song like, songs like, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Or songs like, the B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me. Or maybe the song, Deep and Wide, to teach us about how wide God's love is for us. I remember one of the songs that, that I was taught as a child, both in Sunday school and my parents would sing it to me at home uh, as a little kid. It had this line in it. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful, little eyes, what you see. It's hard to tell how many kids have been taught that important biblical lesson over the years to be careful about the things that we, that we look at. David first taught his son Solomon that important lesson in Psalm 119. In verse 37, he gives his, his young son this prayerful warning. He says, turn my eyes away from worthless things and preserve my life according to your word. Listen to those words again and think about what he's saying. Turn my eyes away from worthless things, but preserve my life according to your word. Now the scripture certainly teaches us that there are some worthless things in this world. There are some dangerous things in life that we need to turn our eyes away from. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16 calls these things the lust of the eyes. It refers to that way of, of sinning, lusting with our eyes. We see something that we want, that we don't have any business desiring after, let alone even, even putting our eyes towards or, or looking at. This has been a problem with mankind going all the way back to the beginning. When Adam and Eve were in the garden, Satan tempted them with the forbidden fruit. And one of the ways he tempted them was because it was pleasing to the eye. Jesus gives us another warning about that or another illustration of that uh, over in Matthew chapter 28 in the Gospels or Matthew chapter 5 in the Gospels. Matthew 5, 28, Jesus tells us that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Let's go back to the man who penned the words of our text for this morning, David. David's son Solomon, we know that his father was David, but a lot of times we conveniently forget that his mother's name 
Her name was Bathsheba. Now, David and Bathsheba, if you're familiar with their story, they didn't exactly meet in a Bible study. 2 Samuel chapter 11 tells their story of how they met and uh, how they came about. And it says that it, the story begins in, in the beginning of that chapter. It was the time when kings normally went off to war. David would have been right there on the battlefield fighting with his men, but that, reason, that, uh, that year, for some reason or another, David decided to stay back at the palace. And he was there, and the scripture kind of indicates that he had been there for a while, and he got bored. One day he wandered up to the top of the palace and he was walking around on the roof and he looked over and he saw this young woman Bathsheba bathing. Well, instead of turning his eyes and going back inside and just trying to forget what he had seen, he he gazed at her. And he took a long, lustful look at her. Then he had Bathsheba brought to his palace and he had an affair with her. The result of their affair was she became pregnant. Well, David wanted to cover up his sins, so he sent for her husband who was a soldier out fighting. He sent for her husband Uriah to be brought home and hoped that he would have some union with his wife and uh, and that it would cover up David's sin. It would cover up the affair. Well, Uriah was such a godly man and he didn't want to do anything, you know, to come home and enjoy his wife while his men were out fighting uh, fighting on on the front lines of the war. So he wouldn't even go near his wife. He went back to the battle line and David sent word to have Uriah, to have him murdered. Not long after Uriah's murder, Nathan the prophet came and confronted David about his sin with with Bathsheba and told him that the result, one of the results of their sin together was that the child she was pregnant with was going to soon die. Now if David would have kept his eyes from worthless things, he'd have saved himself and so many others a ton of heartache. A lot of times when we think about this sin of looking at things that we're not supposed to look at or, or, or gazing at things that we're not supposed to be gazing at, we, we think that's not that big of a deal. I want you to think about, think about how all this started with David. He saw Bathsheba bathing and his lust led to adultery. His adultery led to lying. Lying led to murder. Murder led to a national scandal that brought shame on both David and his family and the entire nation of Israel. Their sin resulted in the death of a child. In Matthew chapter 5 verse 29, Jesus tells us that if your right eye, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and to throw it away. For it would be better to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Now, I know that sounds pretty harsh, but there's a pandemic going on in America right now that's a whole lot further reaching and a whole lot stronger and a whole lot worse than the coronavirus. It's the pandemic of pornography. The statistics on pornography are both eye-opening and at the same time depressing. Listen to this. Nearly 30,000 Americans are viewing pornography at any given second. One in five mobile searches are porn related. The average age for a male to have their first exposure to hardcore pornography is now 12 years old. 56% of divorce cases in America involve one party having an obsessive interest in pornographic websites. Over $3,000 is spent on porn every second on the internet. I was thinking about the fact that David, how he began this whole tracked down to sin with Bathsheba during a time in his life where he was stuck at home because he wasn't out working. He wasn't out doing what he was, would have normally done in his normal routine. How he got bored and that led, that led to the lust. I was thinking about that and, you know, there's some similarities with what we're going through in our nation now with much of America being that, uh, having a stay-at-home order. And I was wondering if, if there would be a correlation between that and the pornography statistics. Unfortunately, it didn't take long to find out that the answer is yes. Pornhub, the world's largest pornography website, has seen an 18% increase in activity since the coronavirus started. 18%. You know, this sin is destroying minds. This sin is destroying lives. This sin is destroying hearts, and it is destroying homes. I want to warn you this morning. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. 
For the Father up above, He's looking down in love. But He's warning us to be careful little eyes what you see. David said to his son, Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. God tells us what to turn our eyes away from. He tells us the things that we don't need to be looking at. He even warns us that if we need to, gouge out your eyes and throw them away. That would be better. Let's make sure we're heeding his warnings. Let's make sure that we're following his commands. God bless you. Good morning, Gold Point family. As you sit around your house and you look at different things, a lot of things probably will give you some remembrance of different things, like maybe that coffee cup you're drinking right now. Or maybe it's the couch that's at your house. Or maybe it's even the house that you're living in reminds you of your mom or your dad. Or maybe, maybe it's the idea of places that we've went. Things that we have a lot of times reminds us of different things that we've done or where we've been. As we first, as I first came, the first couple of the first actual day that I was here at Gold Point, um, we were supposed to go fishing together. Me and Mr. Chris and Mr. Jonathan Dale were all supposed to go fishing, and we we're supposed to meet Mr. Chris at seven o'clock at his house. Well, my 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 phone was about a hundred percent, so I figured I wouldn't charge it that night. I set my alarm for six o'clock. Going to get up, get ready, be ready for for our fun day at fishing. Next thing you know. It's 7.15 and I get a knock on the door. Mr. Chris is coming to, my, to the door, knocking on it as I run to the door, run outside, and I ask, just give me two minutes. Well, every time I go fishing, I kind of realize and remember that story of how we went fishing that day. I was just late on the first day at work. Or maybe one of the first, the, the first week I was here, there was a... <laughs> <laughs> there was actually a, a doorknob that looked just like this that was on the parsonage. It had a lock on one side and had the, the piece on the other. And next thing you know, um, I locked the keys in the, uh, in the parsonage. I, I go to Mr. Chris and ask him to see if he can help me unlock the door. Well, let's just say we got it unlocked. You see, there are a lot of things that we look at or things that we had that reminds us of what different stories or different places we went. Jesus also gave us this example as well. He gave us this uh, communion or the Last Supper. When he was with the disciples, he's even given it to us. And this morning as we get ready to partake of communion this morning, we need to remember what Christ did for us. He, he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Take and eat. To remember what Christ did for us on that cross. How he, how he died. How he was beaten and bruised, and put on that cross. But then he also took the cup, and he gave thanks, and he gave it to his disciples, said, drink. In the same way, he said, remember my blood that is being shed on this cross. Remember what I'm doing for you, because what I'm doing, no one else could do. And as we remember this morning, what Christ did for us on that cross is greater than any other thing that we can have to remember things with. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the gift of memory that you've given us all. And Lord, whether it's looking back at uh, a funny memory about a fishing pole or a doorknob or, or looking at a serious memory that we can look at an, an object like a piece of bread or, or a cup of wine and we can see we can see something so important as your son's sacrifice on the cross. We thank you for that. And right now, as we just remember what He did for us on the cross, I pray that uh, we would allow our mind's eye, go, eye to go back to Calvary. Uh, and just look at the cross, Lord, to remember His sacrifice and to examine ourselves against it. Father, so, so that we can strive to live in a worthy manner for You this week. Lord, we love You. We thank You so much for Jesus and His willingness to sacrifice. Right before we start our junior church lesson, want to pray. 
We actually have one of our junior church kids who sent me his, uh, his prayer right before he ate dinner one night this last week. So I want to share that with you and as we start, as we get ready to pray. God, God is great. God is good. Let us take the full of you. By your hands, we must be fed. You may pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning as we get ready to start our junior church lesson. Good morning, Gold Point family and Junior Church kids. I'm so excited to bring you another lesson on this idea of drawing closer to Jesus. Before we look at this week, let's look at the last two weeks. Two weeks ago, we learned that we can pray anytime and anywhere. We learned that we can talk to God just like talking to a friend. And we also learned that God wants us to talk to Him. He wants us to pray to, t pray to Him. The things we learned last week is that through things that we see... That's how we draw closer to Jesus, because the things we see, that God created everything. Each thing that God creates has purpose and meaning, and He created us, and we also have purpose and meaning. As we draw closer to Jesus this morning, we're going to look at the idea of drawing closer through His Word. It's so important that we take time throughout not only this time of quarantine and, and where we have to stay at home, but all days and all times to be able to read God's Word, to be able to open it up and understand just a little bit more of who Jesus is, what God did, and how He wants a relationship with us. And so, I'm going to try to explain this to you in ways of cartoons. We have multiple different cartoons that I'm going to show you and when they were, when they aired, when they first uh, came on TV. The first one that we have is Tom and Jerry. Tom and Jerry came on in 1965. That was the first season, the first episode that came on. Tom is the cat. Jerry is the mouse. Tom is always trying to get Jerry, but he never does. We have Scooby-Doo. It aired in 1969. Some of y'all may know who Scooby-Doo is. It's been on for a while. Different kind of episodes of new ones and also old ones. Scooby-Doo is one of the famous ones. Inspector Gadget. I don't know if y'all maybe heard of them or not. But it's this guy who uh, fights crime and tries to do different things like that by using these gadgets, different things, to be able to catch um, the bad guys. Hey Arnold came on in 1990. This is a TV show on Nickelodeon where uh, you, have this, uh, you have this one guy and he plays sports and, and that kind of thing. And you have this one girl that always picks on him because she likes him. It's a really cool show. Uh, one of my favorites. SpongeBob SquarePants is probably one that all of us have, have probably heard of. Um, it's been on since 2000. It is 20 years old and still running, I believe, today. It started on Nickelodeon, and uh, we, we know about Spongebob and Sandy and Patrick and all their people that live under the sea. Spongebob Squarepants. It's been on for quite some time. The last one that we're going to see this morning is Dude Perfect Show. It's these guys who do some incredible things by hitting a basketball with a bat and knocking it into the, the basketball hoop or, or throwing a football out of an airplane or just incredible things that they do and make shots and this kind of thing. And they started a show in 2017. You see, if we go back to Tom and Jerry, or if we go back even farther, your parents or grandparents probably watch cartoons just like you do today. If you ask them to see what kind of cartoons they watch, they would tell you, maybe Tom and Jerry, maybe other, uh, other cartoons like that. They could maybe even tell you specific, um, specific episodes where maybe, uh, maybe Tom actually gets Jerry or may, whatever it may be. You see, that's kind of how the Bible is a little bit. It's the idea that you see where people wrote stuff down and as you read it in the Bible, you can be able to see that what they wrote is number one true, but number two, you can be able to understand where they're coming from. It talks about the history of the Bible. It talks about Jesus as he was walking on, on this earth. You had the disciples and you had the, the apostles who wrote down different things that, that Jesus did, what he said. 
You have Psalms and you have what, 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 what uh, David talked about. Or maybe it's Job and the situation that he went through. Or, or Noah and the flood. Or Moses and, 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 and Pharaoh and, and the Egyptians and trying to get out of there. Maybe it's how God created. There's so many different stories in the Bible and how it's written. And how it's wrote down for us to be able to read. The same thing with cartoons. Your parents could tell you about episodes and different cartoons they watched when they were younger because they remembered them. In the same way, these people, these 40 writers that wrote the Bible could take what they learned and what they understood and what they saw and wrote it down for us. Some of the biggest reasons that we have the Bible is God wants a relationship with us. And so God sent His Son Jesus. And as He sent Jesus, He gave us this opportunity to be able to uh, accept Him. To be able to want to be a part of His family. You see, there are so many different parts of this Bible. And to see the history of how the Bible is written. You see, in the same way, John, I think, writes it pretty well in John 20, 30-31. It says this, Jesus performed many other signs and the presence of His disciples, which are not recorded in this book. He did so many other things that aren't even recorded in, in the Bible or in the book of John. But they, these are written so that you may believe that, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that, that by believing you, have life, you may have life in His name. One of the biggest reasons why this book, why this book is called the Bible and why we take it for, for such a powerful book and so sacred to us is because it tells us who Jesus is, what he did for us on that cross, and how he rose from the grave. It talks about stories of war that's happened and, and different situations that they got through because of God and his mercy for his people. We see in a regular history book, maybe it's the history of the United States or maybe it's the history of the world. We see where different wars happen. Different famines or different, different things happen and we read about them. Who the presidents were. Who, who uh, were the rulers of different, different times. And we read the, the, these history books to be able to understand what happened even when even our grandparents weren't even here. And so in the same way, the Bible was written for us to be able to read, to comprehend, to understand and to be able to use to not only understand, but to tell others about the good news of who not only Jesus is, but what the Bible brings to us. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is God-breathed. Now that doesn't mean that God physically wrote the Bible, but He took people, special people who wrote the Bible, to be able to not only write it, but the Holy Spirit guided them to write, write what we read in Scripture. Why do we read it? Because it's useful. It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. It's used for a multiple different purposes. And we see here of different reasons why we read the Bible and why we understand it. And verse 17 says, So that the servant of God may be fully equipped for every good work. It's for us to be able to be equipped for every good work that we do. And not only that we do, but to understand God's mercy and His grace. Two, two things that we learned this week is that writers who wrote, the, wrote and saw what they, what they wrote and experienced what they wrote it's not only the idea that the, the, the idea that they saw or the experience they had, but it's that they wrote it down for us to understand. In the same way, we talked about your parents watching different cartoons or your grandparents watching different cartoons, and they can explain to you what these cartoons are and how they're written or, or how, they, how they watch them. And as they watch them, they can be able to tell you different episodes that happen. In the same way, disciples, apostles, people like Paul, David, um, Job, Moses, all wrote in the Bible to be able to help us understand what happened back in the day. The second thing is that um, God guided the writers of the Bible. Remember, God breathed. He guided them through the Holy Spirit to help understand the history and the events that happened in the Bible. But not only that, 
but to guide everyone through life to be able to understand the goodness and the grace that God has for us through Jesus Christ. And so as we look at these different things, what are some things that we have goals for? We have goals to read the Bible this week. If you don't mind, if you could read on Monday, Genesis 3.16. On Tuesday, Genesis 1.1. On Wednesday, Ephesians 6, 1 through 2. Thursday, could you read Psalms 107, 1? On Friday, Ephesians 4, 32. On Saturday, 1 John 3, 16. And on Sunday, Genesis 2, 2. Not only can you read it, but could you draw a picture for me on each day? Just draw a picture of each thing that you read. Maybe you don't, maybe you have something particular that you would like to read. Go ahead and read that and draw a picture for me as well. Either way, however you want to do that, send a picture to me so we can be able to see what you read each day. Guys, as we continue to draw closer, there's a lot of ways of drawing closer to Jesus. But we look this week at how we can draw closer to Jesus through His Word.